Hello everyone. So today we are going to discuss SBR March 2020 paper. Right? Uh, in this video, I'm going to discuss question one. Right? So before we go to question one, let me tell you for the ones for whom this is the first paper. Right? So the format of the paper is there are four questions. Two questions in each section. That means section A has two questions, section B has two questions. And the marks are one question. The first question is for 30 marks. Second question comes for 20 marks. The third is 25 and fourth comes 20. So you can attempt the question in any order. That is the beauty of SBR. Right, you can attempt the question in any order, it does not matter. Right. So before I go and read the case study, I will always start with the requirements. So yes, this you can see it's for 30 marks, right? So requirement first requirement is draft a explanatory note to the directors of Hummings company addressing the following. How the functional currency of cartridge, cartridge should be determined is for five marks, right? No calculation, this is theory. Next we have, so here the main thing is functional currency, right? B, how the Crochet company's customer contracts should be accounted for in the consolidated financial statements of Humming, which are presented in dollar for the year ended. So this is talking about the customer contract. How this will be accounted in the consolidated financial statements. Right? So make sure that you know what is what customer contracts are and how it should be accounted in the consolidated financial statements. And it's for four marks. And also you know what is functional currency. Third, a calculation of the goodwill on the accusation of Crochet Company in Gromets. Gromets is a currency. And how it should be accounted for in the consolidated statement of financial position of Humming Company at 31st December 2004 after translation. Right? So this is asking two things. First, calculation of goodwill. Calculation of goodwill on accusation. That is first thing. Right? in governments. Second, how it would be accounted for in the consolidated financial statements? How in the consolidated statement of financial position? Second, okay, after translation. Second thing is include a brief explanation of calculation of how the impairment and the exchange difference on goodwill will impact on the consolidated financial statements. So you have to know the impairment and the exchange difference on goodwill, right? And consolidated financial statements, right? Is a question that you can expect 100%, right? You, you don't have to think about it. You can, I, like you can close your eyes and you can tell that you will be getting a question on consolidation, consolidated financial statement. So don't skip this consolidated consolidation is the first thing you have to study because this is a question you are getting 100 percent you will be getting a question on consolidated financial statements you will be getting questions on accusation of a group of a company of a subsidiary of an associate right next how quaver should be accounted for in the consolidated financial statements so quaver is another company they are talking about how this accounted in the consolidated financial statements and the last one which is for the majority of the marks which is for 11 marks a calculation and a discussion of how the bonds should be accounted for in the financial statements of Hummings at 31st December 2003 and for the year ended 31st December 2004 including any impairment loss so first it's a calculation second it's a discussion it's about bonds how it be accounted 
in this two dates there are two dates given right most of you just take only one date either you just take 31st december 2004 either you take 31st december 2003 right but you have to take both the dates including any impairment losses you cannot ignore this and it's why 11 marks right so the total time even for this paper it's for it's 1.8 minutes per mark so that means it's for 30 marks so 30 into 1.8 will give you 54 minutes 54 minutes only you have to spend on this right sorry calculation and what yes so now i have highlighted what okay the same way how i have told in afm that each paragraph is for each requirement and it's set in order so you don't have to worry you don't have to read the whole case study to answer so in this case also even in sbr we can follow the same technique for example a right how the functional currency will should be determined so when you go back to the case study right only this part only this part this paragraph the functional currency we are going to read only this part and answer that question we don't have to read the whole case study to answer that so this is one good advantage right in sbr all the questions are set like that right your first okay let me repeat this again because for afm i have already told but for the sbr let me repeat is the same thing only your first paragraph will be linked with your uh, the way your case study has been set up even your requirement the questions are like that for example this the first you come in is talking about functional currency your second you come in will be talking about the accusation your third will be something talking about quaver and finally the last requirement was about bonds and the bond came bond they have discussed about bonds at the end so your requirement and the way your case study is presented is the same same order you can so you don't have to read the whole case study you can just read part of those uh, sentences or paragraphs which is important to answer your requirement right but background make sure that when you get the paper background is not very big it will be three four lines but background you have to read right so let's read what is the background okay humming company is the parent company who is the parent company always underline always make sure that you know who is the parent company because when you do consolidation it is the parent company parent companies statement of financial position you need to take into account right of a multinational listed group of companies humming company uses dollar as its functional currency so it is using dollar humming company humming company acquired 80% of the equity shares of crochet on 1st of jan 2004 and 100% of quava company on the same date so two company has been acquired 80 and 100 right the group's uh, current financial year end is 31st december 2004 now let's go to the second heading which is talking about crochet the functional currency right so now the head office of crochet is located in a country which uses the dinar as its main currency right the head company the head office is located in a country which uses dinar as its main currency however its staff are located in variety of other locations consequently half of their employees are paid in dinars and other half are paid in the currency of grumets so half in dinars other half in gumet they have uh, crochet has a high degree of autonomy high degree of autonomy and is not reliant on finance from hummings this are very important things whenever you talk about functional currency in which currency your sales are happening in which currency the payments are happening in which currency financing in which currency uh, purchases are there in which currency you are paying your uh, supplier your customer all these things are very important when you come when you come to determine functional currency whenever you see these words you have to underline highlight okay so it is and it's not relying on finance from humming so not relying on finance from this not do sales to humming company make up of a makes up a significant proportion of their income right 
not do sales makes up okay which makes up a significant portion of the income all of his sales and purchases are invoiced in what all of his sales and purchases are invoiced in gromits this is very important and therefore crochet raises most of his finance in what gromits right cash receipts are retained in both gromits and dinars so cash receipts are both in this and this crochet does not own a dollar bank account does not own a dollar bank account is required okay crochet uh, crochet crochet is required by the law to pay tax on his profits in dinars pay tax on his profit in dinars so now you have to tell what is the functional currency of crochet is it dollar is it dinar is it gromit three currencies are there you have to decide now let's see how this answer has been presented and it's for five marks so you have to give at least five points it's very clear right i don't know what's happening today I cut this okay yes. so this is the answer right this is the answer okay so now you can see right that this has been divided into two paragraphs always write your answer in paragraphs don't try to write all the five points in one paragraph only now let's see what they have written okay so the functional currency is the currency first you have to define what is functional currency so the first paragraph they are defining now the first line the functional currency is the currency of the primary economic environment in which the entity operates within a foreign accusation consideration should be given as to whether crochet company should adopt the same functional currency as his parent that means is should they adopt dollar as their functional currency because parent company is humming and humming is having the functional currency dollar has its functional currency right so now they are saying the consideration should be given whether as the dollar should be the functional currency or however crochet appears to be largely independent and not and is not relying on humming company for either sales or finance right first you are giving the definition you start with the definition of functional currency right then you have to talk about foreign accusation because this is a foreign accusation you have to say in what happens when a foreign accusation takes place what should be your consideration so they are saying first consideration should be whether they should adopt the same functional currency as his parent company even when you are given this question in your exam right everything will be same except the currencies might be changed but still when you start a question on functional currency you have to start like this first you have to define functional currency just one line that's it you don't have to tell it five six lines explaining what is functional currency right then you have to second will be you have to bring this in consideration of a foreign accusation right so what happens first consideration is functional currency whether functional currency of the parent company can be adopted here if it if it can be adopted then your problem is solved you can say that this is the functional currency of the crochet based on this this factors but here in this case dollar cannot be a functional currency of crochet why so that why now you have to answer like this however with this word however why you cannot adopt dollar as a functional currency because right crochet appears to be largely independent let me highlight the words why it is not taking dollar as a functional currency right so first number point number one point is independent crochet is largely independent it is not reliant it is not reliant on hummings the parent company for either sales or finance sales or finance right 
clearly these things are mentioned in the case study in that paragraph you just have to take the point and write it in your own words that's it next it is not required therefore for this uh, crochet to adopt the same functional currency as humming right finally you are giving this line let me put this inside the bracket so that you know why this line is there this line has to be there finally you have to tell just by saying that uh, uh, crochet appears independent not relying on humming company for sales or finances not enough you have to add this line you have to tell that finally okay therefore it is not required or the dollar will not be a functional currency or something like this right dollar will not be a functional currency of crochet this line has to be there because then you are making it clear that this is not a functional currency right you are eliminating one by one and finally you are coming to a point that this is the functional currency that's how your step has to approach has to be because this is for five marks if this question came for one or two marks then you could just say that this is not the functional currency or this is the functional currency based on this factor but here it's for five marks and three currencies are involved so first you are eliminating the ones which are not so dollar is not a functional currency now what are the choices left the other two currency right gromits right gromits and dinar now let's see okay uh, crochet company does not appear to have transaction in dollars okay or have a dollar bank account does not have okay not appear to have transaction in dollars or they don't have a bank dollar bank account and it can be concluded that the dollar should not be their functional currency this conclusion dollar should not be functional currency this thing has to be there whenever you write on functional currency make sure that you write these lines maybe in your exam the currency will be different but you have to mention this hence or therefore it is concluded that this is not the functional currency now let's go to the second paragraph second para right in determining its functional currency crochet should consider the currency which mainly influences its sales price of goods and currency which mainly influences its labor and other costs this things comes from your textbook from your knowledge so you can write this how a functional currency is determined make sure that you go through this because i have seen this question is repeated even during my time i got this question this was the first question how a functional currency is determined in fact right i got it back in 2019 so i can see that even after one year this question is repeated so that means this is a very popular question so you have to know how a functional currency is determined right okay wherever wherever we okay the location okay so uh, i'm sorry it is this okay this is likely to be the currency which goods are invoiced in and currency in which costs are settled the location of the entity's head office is irrelevant irrelevant location of head office is irrelevant except to the extent that it is likely that the cost of running the head office are likely to be settled in domestic currency for crochet while okay this there are number of transactions in dinars right and tax has to be paid in dinars right number of transaction in dinars tax has to be paid in dinars so the second currency they are talking about is dinars right there are number of transaction that has to be this all these things they have brought up from the case study only that number of, okay number of transactions are in dinars tax has to be paid in dinars it appears that the vast majority of their transactions vast majority of their transactions are in gromits all sales and purchases are invoiced in gromits as well as approximately half of their stuff are being paid in gromit funds for finance are raised in gromit which further suggest that gromit should be chosen as a functional currency gromit should be chosen as the functional currency finally you have to tell which currency is the functional currency you should end like this first you should start eliminating the currencies which are when you read the case study that time itself you have to know what is the functional currency the answer 
has to be there in your mind what is the functional currency right while writing the answer you cannot think what is the functional currency when you are reading the case study itself you have to know this is the functional currency keep it aside first start discussing what is functional currency then tell why dollar is not a functional currency then tell why dinar is not a functional currency then finally conclude your answer because because it is vast majority of sales and purchases are in gromits it is financing gromits employees are paid in gromits therefore gromit is a functional currency that's it right it's just a very simple task and it's worth 5 marks just follow the steps that's it now let's go to the second um i'm sorry i don't know what's happening okay right let's go to the second requirement this is how you have to answer each requirement just use the appropriate paragraph for that and find out right second how uh, crochet companies customer contract should be accounted for in the consolidated financial statements which are presented in dollar right so now we'll go and read about all the customer contracts so this all things accusation of coever impairment of bonds are not needed for that accusation of crochet is also not needed for it is needed here yeah. right so let's read the accusation of this one so now you know that first paragraph you don't need it is out right and trust me this method this technique of answering rather than reading the whole this thing and then answering is time saving also you remember the information also and it's time saving great time saver so accusation of crochet company okay Humming Company is paid cash of 24 million for the 80% holding in Crochet Company on 1st of Jan 2004. That means the consideration is 24 million, right? Humming Company has a policy of measuring non-controlling interest at fair value. The fair value of non-controlling interest was 6 million, right? Paid cash. fair value of nic is 6 million since crochet has a range of net assets always underline the important words right so since crochet has a range of net assets held domestically and overseas fair value of net assets at acquisition were determined in their local currency hence the fair value of some assets has been determined in dinars and others in gromits so the total fair value of the net assets denominated in gromit was 43 million gromit right net asset and net asset which is denominated in dinar is 50 million dinar so make sure that you don't add both of this please check the currency they are not in the same currency you need to convert into gromit now let's go down and see okay excluded from this fair values are several contracts with the customers of crochet this contractual relationships prohibit the customers of crochet from obtaining services from any of the main competitors okay prohibit from obtaining services from main competitors they have an estimated fair value of 15 million right At 31st December 2004, it was decided to impair the goodwill by 30%, and also the summary of exchange rates between dollar, gomit, and dinar has been given. Right, so impair goodwill. That's it. The rest of the information you don't need it. Right. So with this information, you can answer. Right. So the requirement asked was how it will be accounted. Right. in the consolidated financial statements so first of all whenever this question comes make sure in which currency which currency you are dealing this has to be in what currency it has to be in dollar not gromit it has to be in dollar why because this is a consolidated financial statements consolidation whenever comes pair and company 
parent company is humming company humming company's functional currency is dollar so everything at the end has to be converted to dollar before you consolidate even this customer contracts has to be converted to dollar before you consolidate so make sure all the answers finally is in dollar your you have to be very strong in which currency you are using right in consolidation once that is clear rest all is very easy so now let's go to the answer and see right now let's read the answer okay ifrs 3 they have mentioned ifrs 3y business combinations right consolidation business combination this is the right place where you can talk about ifrs 3 you have to know where you can use which ifrs which ias which standard you can use in this condition ifrs 3 is the most suitable i ifrs to use it's okay even if you cannot remember the full name of a full name of an if if rs you don't have to name the whole thing but just either remember the number or the name one of this if you cannot remember both like i i f r s 3 business combination you don't have to name you can just say according to i f r s 3 and then start describing right but it's good if you remember the whole thing so i f r s 3 business combinations requires the investor to identify all of the investors identifiable net assets at acquisition all these things are from your textbook only so to be identifiable a customer contract must either be capable of being used or sold separately or it must arise from a legal or contractual rights make sure that you know what a customer contract is how it can be identified how it can be measured how it how it will be recognized when it should be recognized right a reliable estimate of its fair value is also necessary to be recognized as a separate asset rather than some sub some assumed within the goodwill figure this is the case regardless of whether the contracts has been recognized within the individual financial statements of crochet or not even in the individual financial statements if customer contract is not recognized but still this is the case that a reliable okay a reliable estimate of its fair value is necessary so now let's see what's there in the second paragraph the contract provide crochet with a legal right to prevent their customers from obtaining goods and services from their competitors clearly they have told right they are preventing them from buying from their customers and a real and a reliable estimate of fair value appears to be obtainable right that 15 million gromit that was a fair value right an estimate estimate has been done so the contracts so now you have to decide whether this has to be recognized or not most of the time in sbr in the exam you have to the main thing a candidate should know is whether some things has to be recognized or not that is the main thing once you master that thing that this has to be recognized under this condition or this is not recognized under this condition trust me 70% of your work is done right so that is the main thing recognition of something in this case it is the recognition of customer contract whether it has to be recognized or not right so just don't memorize from your past paper some answer is there in some answer it has been recognized that's why when it comes for my exam i also have to recognize or i also should not recognize it's nothing like that it is based on your case study only whether it will be recognized or it will not be recognized there is not a fixed standard that all the time this will not be recognized or this will be recognized all the time there are times when it is not recognized you are always in the you you are always thinking that if something is given this should be recognized this should be recognized you also have an option to say that this will not be recognized in the financial statements why because of this 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 reasons so in this case it looks like that it is recognized right because a fair value estimate has been given 
also it prevents customers from obtaining goods from competitors that's why you can say that this contract you can recognize so the contract should be recognized as a separate intangible asset should be recognized as a separate intangible asset at an initial value of 15 million grommets you need to mention this you need to write these lines that it should be recognized as a separate intangible asset at an initial value at what value it should be recognized you need to write that also this would initially be translated you need to translate this remember you cannot leave your answering grommet it's consolidated financial statement it has to be in dollars so this would initially be translated at the spot rate of exchange one dollar to eight grommet right one dollar to eight when we go back we'll see the currency one dollar to eight is this right not one dollar to seven not the closing one it has to be one to eight why one to eight because goodwill you are initially recognizing in the opening first of jan 2004 not 31st december 2004 don't go and uh, put it seven over there these are the common mistakes because we always assume everything is closing 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 exchange rate, closing spot rate initially it is recognized at first of jan 2004 so therefore one is to eight right so if that means 15 divided by 8 you will get in terms of dollar right it will be transferred the spot exchange rate and would be recognized initially in the consolidated financial statements at 1.875 million right in the consolidated financial statements it will be rec uh, recorded as 1.875 million not 15 million grommet right 15 million divided by 8 the contracts would need to be examined to determine the average unexpired useful life of the contract and amortized over this period customer contracts you have to see since another thing you have to think about this one is this you are recording as a separate intangible asset whenever an intangible asset is recorded or it is recognized next thing that has to come into your mind is what about amortization you have to mention about amortization just by finishing the sentence with 1.875 million full stop your work is not over you need to take talk about amortization whenever an intangible asset is given whenever it could be any intangible asset in this case it is customer contract right and when it's goodwill it's impairment so next line so these are the ways you know what are the what are, what is the next line you have to write in case you get confused how to write right because you are memorizing you're just going through the answer how they have presented but you don't know how to present your answer what is my next point what is my first point so when you come to the next point what to write about is think this is an intangible asset next i have to talk about amortization so there itself you got one point talk about amortization how it will be recognized right so here they have told the contract would need to be examined to determine the average unexpired useful life of the contract and amortized over this period now how amortization will be done right this would be translated at the average rate of exchange and expensed to consolidated profit or loss amortization is a expense it is there in the consolidated profit and loss right and it needs to be translated at average rate you need to know that all the expenses are translated at average rate right all the pnl expense all the pnl items are translated at average rate and finally now you how will you know what that's what is the third line you have to write you talked about amortization also so you talked about intangible asset you talked about amortization the third thing you have to talk is about the closing balance right there will be a closing balance which will go in the financial state statement of financial position the balance sheet so who you have to mention about that also right so the carrying amount of the contract will need to be retranslated 
at what rate closing rate right carrying amount is retranslated at closing rate of exchange what is the closing rate it is it was 1 to 7 at 31st december 2000 4 it was 1 to 7 so you divide this by 7 what are you dividing by 7 the 15 million you are dividing by 7 15 million gromit right so 15 million when you divide by 7 you are getting 2.143 million right with the right with a corresponding exchange gain recognized within EQT. Now this thing, how it's exchange uh, gain? It could be a you have to be very clear whether it's a gain or a loss, right? Because of this, all these things you know that there will be an exchange gain or loss. So the fourth point you got that you have to mention about exchange gain or a loss. This is an exchange gain. Why? Just see the value of the intangible asset in the beginning and the end and compare, right? Before it was 1.875 million, now it is 2.143 million. It increased, that means it's an exchange gain. It's very easy. So that's why it is an exchange gain and you have to know where to record an exchange gain. It is recognized within EQT. So this is how your thought process has to go. When you're thinking what to write, what is the next line, right? First, you're starting with IFRS 3. What IFRS 3 says about net assets, all those things. That is the first paragraph. Second paragraph, you are saying the contract should be recognized or not. In this case, yes, it should be recognized. After that, you have to tell it has to be recognized as what? As an intangible asset. Intangible asset means amortization. Amortization, then you have exchange gain or loss. So exchange gain or loss is reco recorded within equity, right? And also, at what rate each of it will be translated? Whether it's average rate, whether it's opening rate, whether it's closing rate, right? So that's how you have to answer this one. Now let's go to the second part of this. Let's go to the requirement. What is the second requirement saying? The B second requirement, okay? And it's for six marks, okay? A calculation of the goodwill on accusation. So it's a calculation of goodwill. Calculation of goodwill, you have to be very, very thorough, right? Let me tell you this from experience. The calculation of goodwill is a question you will be getting. You will be getting a question on goodwill. You cannot skip that. So you have to go through all the calculations of goodwill in terms of accusation, right? So calculation of goodwill on accusation of uh, crochet in comments in Gromis and how it would be accounted in the consolidated statement of financial position after the translation. Then you have to talk about and calculate the impairment and the exchange difference on goodwill. So we have already read the case study, so I'm not rereading again. Directly we can go to the answer. In case if we need some answer, I will go and go back again to, for the numbers. Or you can have the numbers because Right now, so goodwill at 31st December 2004 would be 8.2 million calculated as follows. Right, this line always write your answer first. Whenever you have to write what is the goodwill data, calculate goodwill, right? Keep one or two lines just to write your answer. Leave space, do your working. And once you get answer, the final answer from your workings, go, go to your first line. You have kept some space. There you can write now. Goodwill is at uh, this date is this much. Calculated as follows. So this, make sure that you follow this method of presenting your answer. Because just knowing just writing all what you know is not enough. If you are not presentable, your answer has to be presented in a good manner, good way. Right? Because, for example, let me tell you, if you don't write this line, 
the first line goodwill at 31st december 2004 would be 8.2 million and you have just done this old this calculation how will anyone know what is the goodwill from this is it 57.4 it is is it 7 is it 8.2 which one which one should i take it is very unclear you have to mention that the goodwill is 8.2 million so please follow this okay first make three columns whenever a translation things come always maintain in column format three columns has to be there i will show you this this three columns has to be there first in the local currency in your currency second the exchange rate third the translated figure in this case it is in dollar right and after that you write a heading first for example the first heading just don't start putting numbers write this headings right what is what is so much to write it doesn't even take one second to write this grow mids exchange rate dollar write it please make a habit of writing and also write this millions it is in millions write it because you are not writing uh, 192000000 you are not writing all the zeros you are eliminating so make sure that on top you write in millions so that when i look at the consideration it is not 192 but 192 million a reader will be able to read it right so write millions on top don't start writing millions in in all your answer and deal unnecessarily deal with so many zeros because it will become very complex for you even your calculation will be very it, very time consuming it does it looks very messy and very hard to digest when a reader is looking your report uh, your goodwill calculation is very hard to digest but this one looks very simple i can tell yes it's 192 million but if that million was not there on the top don't just assume that someone will understand that is 192 million it could be 192000 also 192 so make sure that you write millions on top second exchange rate exchange rate you have to write dollar is to gromits make sure that you write this that it is dollar is to gromit because it could be the other way around also and you might divide where you should multiply or you might multiply where you should divide this mistake is often done when you translate the exchange rate so in order to avoid that mistake write it this is dollar is to gromit one dollar is equal to this many gromit so please write it make a habit of writing it if you are not writing if you don't have the habit at least in this few days practice it before the exam you still have a week left before the exam and a week is more than enough to change your habits and finally dollar in millions right so now let's start this is goodwill start with consideration what is the consideration it was 24 million in cash 24 million dollar so convert it you have to write it in gromit first right multiply by 8 because it was 1 is to 8 the opening right you are not taking the closing 1 is to 7 you are taking 1 is to 8 the opening because consideration you are paying at third, uh, at first of December two thousand four. I'm sorry, Jan. Yeah. So consideration has to be uh, at the opening date. Spot rate you have to translate. So twenty four multiply by eight. Then comes to your non controlling interest at accusation. They have already given you the fair value, which is six million. This also needs to be converted into gromit multiply by 8 then comes your net asset at accusation they have put a small star here right if you can see small star is there why just go down and see this here they have shown how net asset is calculated right you are also supposed to do it like this rather than trying to put all the method how net asset is calculated here right here don't put it here don't put under this one if this if it takes too much of space don't put it there because it looks very untidy put it somewhere separate and make a note or you can just write working one instead of star you can write inside the bracket working one right 
working number one and put it under separate working. So net asset is at acquisition is calculated. This is not given, it is calculated. Whenever a calculated figure is there, you can show it as a separate working. So net asset at acquisition of 43 million gromit, yes. Plus 15 million gromit for the contractual relationship. This 15 million gromit came from the customer contract. You cannot forget that. That also has to be added because you are recognizing it as an intangible asset, right? Always there is a connection with your, let me tell you, this is your second part of B. This will be connected to this. Always there will be some connection. You cannot deal them isolately. You cannot think that this one, each one is separate, so I don't need the previous one is over. The customer contract part is over. I don't need it here. No, it's not like that. Each part is related to each one. So customer contract 15 million you have to add with this 43 million gromit because it comes under net asset it's recognized as intangible asset. If this was not recognized as an intangible asset, then you can ignore it. But here you have to because previously you have recognized it, right? So add 15 and finally there has been a 50 million dinar, right? 100, yeah, 50 million dinar also was there as a net asset, but 15 million Dinar, you cannot add it because both of this 43 and 15 are in Gromit. First, you have to convert to Gromit, right? 1 is to 2, you will convert it at what? 1 is to 2, right? 15 to 2, 100. So 100 plus 43 plus 15, you are getting 158. Minus this and you are getting goodwill on 1st of Jan. Right? This 1st of Jan, so using the 1st of Jan's exchange rate, translated. 82 divided by 8, so 10.25 million. Then go to the impairment because goodwill is there, impairment has to be there. And they have told also that you need to calculate the goodwill and exchange uh, exchange gain effect you have to take. So goodwill is 30%, 30% of 82 deducted. But impairment when you translate to dollar, mind you, it is 7. It is the closing one, not the opening one. Impairment, because it is at the end you do the impairment. You take account so you have to and also impairment is an expense it comes in the PL account so many of you could question that why not average rate right but here it has been assumed it is they are taking at a closing right there has been a debate whether average or closing but you can take closing right there's no harm in that impairment you can take at closing so impairment Closing, they have taken, they are translating at 7 and then they are getting in million, dollar and finally the exchange gain, this exchange gain needs to be calculated, right? Exchange gain, I will tell you how you calculate the exchange gain. So you deduct the impairment from the goodwill and you get this amount. After you get this amount, you divide this by the closing rate, right? Always after you deduct impairment from goodwill, you will be translating at the closing rate only, not the opening rate. So divide this by 7, you will be getting 8.2. Right? So this 8.2. So when you come to the dollar section, this minus this, also minus this, you will be getting some amount. Right? Which And that difference is 1.46. That difference is 1.46. Because at the end, you need a balancing figure which gives you 8.2, like 10.25 minus 3.51. It will come 6 point something. And, and then, it is an exchange gain how? Just deduct the impairment from the goodwill. 10.25 minus 3.51. You'll be getting, okay, let me give you the exact figure. You'll be getting 6.74, right? Here you're having 6.74, right? Here you are having 8.2. So you tell me, if you are having an exchange loss, exchange loss is deducted, right? And if you deduct something from 6.74, you will never get 8.2. So it is clear that it's an exchange again. Only in exchange again, something you have to add with 6.74 to get 8.2.
So addition is exchange gain, so 1.46. So that's why 1.46 is exchange gain, right? Just this calculation part is not enough. Don't think your work is over. They told to explain also. Explanation also they have put in different paragraph. Now let's see the, uh, this part. This is the explanation. Whatever you put in calculation, if they tell to explain, you also need to explain. It's not hard. You are just explaining the calculation. Right? So goodwill, let's see what they have written. Goodwill is initially recognized at the spot exchange rate and so would initially be 10.25 million. The impairment loss of 3.51 million will be expensed, right? It's a loss, impairment loss, will be expensed against consolidated profit or loss. Goodwill will be retranslated using the closing rate of exchange. Okay, with the exchange rate, uh, with the exchange gain included within, okay, exchange gain, where is it included? It is included within other gain, other comprehensive income. Exchange gain is included within other comprehensive income. This you must be knowing from your knowledge, right? So since non-controlling interest is valued at fair value, both impairment and the exchange gain, right? will be a portion 18 into 20 because it, they have acquired 80% only. So 18 to 20, NIC is 20% between the shareholders of Humming and the NIC respectively. You need to mention about this NIC and the 80 20 for the goodwill and the exchange gain, for the impairment and the exchange gain. So this is how your impairment question, goodwill question will look like. And this is how you have to answer, right? Whenever calculation and explanation comes, always start with calculation and then start explaining now let's go to the third the c part right however should be accounted for in the consolidated financial statement this we cannot answer because we haven't read about quaver so we have to go and read this part the accusation of quaver right so on 1st of Jan 2004, Humming purchased 100% equity interest in Quaver. Humming's made the accusation with the intention to sell and therefore did not wish to have an active involvement in the business. Intention to sell, did not wish active involvement in the business. Humming company immediately began to seek a buyer for Quaver and felt that the sale will be completed by 31st October 2004 at the latest. A buyer for this one was located in August 2004. But due to an unforeseen legal, okay, due to unforeseen legal dispute over the contingent liability disclosed in Quaver's financial statements, the sale had not been finalized. Sale has not been finalized. As 31st December, the sale is expected to be completed in early 2005. Expected early 2005. Right? I'm not going to touch impairment of bonds because it is not related to this. So now, we'll see how this will be accounted for immediately when you read the scenarios you should always be ready with your ifrs or ias so in this what is the ifrs you can think about what is this ifrs intention to sell a subsidiary right this is ifrs 5 exactly let's see how this has been presented is for four marks right even the answer is very small, right? So, it appears as if the accusation should be treated as a subsidiary acquired exclusively with a view for resale. The usual criteria for an asset to be classified as has held for sale as per IFRS 5, right? Includes. So, all these four things, you need to include what are the criteria for classifying something as held for sale. Whenever this question comes, IFRS 5, whether something has to be classified as help or sell, right? That time, you have to give the criteria. First, you have to give the criteria. What are the criteria for under IFRS 5 to help something as a sell? Then you have to tell whether something satisfies the this criteria or not. So the four criteria are, right? Sale must be highly probable. Sale must be expected within 12 months. The asset must be actively marketed at a reasonable price and management must, make a, must be committed to a plan of sale. And it is unlikely that any significant changes to the plan will be made. That means they have to be firm with their plan of selling. 
Okay, so now let's see what they have written in the next paragraph. The sale has not taken place within 12 months of accusation. Exactly, because they told that it will be expected to be sold early 2005, right? However, an exception is permitted when the sale is still deemed to be highly probable and delay was caused by events which were unforeseen and beyond the control of management. So whenever some event happens which is beyond the control of management, there is an exception to this rule. Even if it has not taken place within 12 months, but still if the sale has a very high, high probable, right, highly probable, then there's an exception. So the sale is still expected early in 2005 and the legal dispute was unforeseen. So this exception seems applicable. In this case, this exception is applicable because legal dispute was unforeseen, right? It is an event which you have, you can, you, you didn't foresee. It's unforeseen event not in your control it appears that it appears clear that the management was immediately committed to the sale as Howing did not wish to have an active involvement in the activities of C see when they acquired the company in the beginning itself they did not have an active involvement that itself says that how focused the management is how committed they are for the sale because they didn't have any active involvement in the business from the day they have acquired the company. All these pieces of information, this is how you have to use your uh, statements, your information from the case study. You have to know how to pick and where to put. Right? Not active involvement. Right? All this says that they are immediately committed to sell. Whoever Company, however, should therefore be treated as a subsidiary acquired exclusively with a view to resale. So now you are giving your conclusion that yes, it has to be viewed as a resale. And if something is classified as a sale under IFRS 5, what is the treatment? Can you consolidate it? You can't. It should not be consolidated, not be consolidated. Into the Hummings Group financial statements. Whoever company should initially be valued at fair value less cost to sell with any subsequent decrease in fair value less cost to sell taken to consolidated profit or loss right initially they have to be valued at what fair value less cost to sell right you have to mention about this fair value less cost to sell you cannot just say that it's not consolidated in the financial statements full stop Further, you have to say that initially this will be valued at fair value less cost to sell because it has been classified as view to resell, right? As a subsidiary is acquired exclusively for resale, whoever should be classified as a discontinued activity, right? It is continued as a disactivity activity and earnings for the year disclosed. Earnings for the year is disclosed separately in the consolidated statement of profit or loss. You have to be very thorough with your IFRS 5. And IFRS 5 is also a standard which I have seen. It is repeated most of the time. It appears in your exam most of the time I have seen IFRS 5. So make sure that you go through this. And finally, the last section of 1D, which talks about bond, but again will reread the requirement. Right? It is always good that you reread the requirement once again. Always have the habit of rereading the requirements again. Not just once. Right? If you can see that I'm, I have taken around 59 minutes now. Right? And this question I was supposed to do in 54 minutes. And now I'll be taking more time in D. Like I'm exiting the time limit. Right? That's because I'm, I'm stopping in between and I'm, and I'm explaining you people how to do, what are the mistakes, what are the how to correct it so that's why i'm taking more time than the usual time but when you practice this question make sure it's only 54 minutes not 53 not 55 because if you're taking less time also in something that means you are not writing points you're not writing sufficient points you just want to write something and finish the paper that is also not a good strategy finishing too early finishing too late just on the time yes maybe one or two minutes you can finish before it's fine, 
but not you cannot finish a question which is for 54 minutes you cannot finish it in 28 minutes or 30 minutes and say that i'm done rather you cannot take uh, an hour and hour more or 30 minutes more for this right so stick to 54 minutes when you practice writing finally d this question this part d please pay more attention this is this talks about ifrs 9 financial instruments and this is most one of the hardest ifrs in sbr so far i know it's the most confusing most complicated most hardest ifrs 9 but once you get it it will be the easiest right and i have seen people saying that they are praying that they don't get ifrs 9 in the exam and they omit it completely they don't go through this so don't do this mistake please ifrs 9 go through this if it does not come in your exam it's good but if it comes then you're not in a bad position at least you can tackle it so you have to be in a position to tackle it right don't just pray that it does not come and you ignore the chapter itself ifrs 9 is a very big chapter financial assets financial liabilities how it is uh, presented measured there are many ways so please make sure right and that's why please pay more attention to this critical right critically you have to pay attention to this the rest all you can do it yourself but part d please pay attention before i start i'm warning so a calculation and a discussion of how the bonds should be accounted for in the financial status of humming at 31st december 2003 and 31st december 2004 including any impairment losses now we'll go and read the bond part impairment of bond so on 31st december 2003 right Hummings purchased 10 million 5% bond in Stave company at par value. The bond are repayable on 31st December 2006 and the effective rate of interest is 8%. Hummings company's business model. Always make sure what is the business model, especially if, uh, when bond, all this type of things appears, right? Bond loans right financial assets financial uh, liabilities whenever this terms you hear right pay very close attention to the business model because based on your business model only you will you can decide where how it will be recorded so business model is very important right so now let's read right Humming company's business model is to collect the contractual cash flows over the life of the asset. Highlight, please highlight, underline the business model. At 31st December 2003, the bonds were considered to be low risk. Low risk. Check the date. Date is very important. 31st December only the bond was considered to be low risk. And as a result, the 12 month expected credit losses are expected to be 10,000. Make sure that you go, you know what is this expected credit losses, lifetime expected cre uh, credit losses. Make sure that you know these terms before you appear for SBR exam. Right? So, because it is low risk, right? So they have given a 12 month expected credit losses, not a lifetime credit losses. It cannot happen that it's a lifetime because it's low risk, right? On 31st December, to, now the second para talks about 2004 scenario, right? So on 31st December, 2004, Steve company paid the coupon interest. However, that date, the risk associated with the bonds were deemed to have increased significantly. So the increased significantly, what the risk? The present value of the repayment for the year under 31st December 2005 was estimated to be this. Right? Present value of the repayment for 2005. And the probability of default is 3%. 
At 31st December 2004, it is also anticipated that no further coupon payments would be received during the year end of 31st December 2006 and only a portion of the nominal value of the bond would be repaid. And the present value of this cash shortfalls was assessed to be this and a 5% likelihood of default in the year end of 31st December 2006. Right? So the question asked you, yes, calculation and discussion. You need to calculate and you need to discuss both. Yes, and it's for 11 marks. So imagine if someone is not prepared for this IFRS 9, losing 11 marks, it's not a game, right? It's no fun. One, one mark, right? One, one mark is very important because people fail at 49. And it is the longest answer if you see, right? I wish, I really wish I could give you some shortcuts for this, but there is no shortcut for this. There are so many things you will be getting a headache by now looking at this answer. You're like, oh my God, so much of it. Don't worry, break this piece of information into tiny pieces and then try to absorb right so i will go slow i will go a bit slow even though it will take more time for me but i will go slow on this because it will take some time for you to absorb this i know it's hard but if someone is very confident in this part you can fast forward my video and check it's fine it is for those people who are a little weak who are weak on this area that i'm focusing more on right so since the business model always start what is the business model right number one point start business model okay so start with the business model so since the business model of humming is to what collect contractual cash flows of bonds over the life of the asset the bond should be measured at amortized cost amortized cost there are many ways of measuring the bond by the way based on the business model right so in this case it is measured at amortized cost second all financial assets including amortized cost assets should initially be recognized at fair value right fair value next they are talking about fair value right all financial assets including amortized cost assets why amortized cost assets they are talking about because this is measured at amortized cost right so they should initially be recognized at what fair value again it's very important then this would be equal to what was the bond it has been purchased at what 10 million so this would be equal to 10 million paid on accusation of the bond right 10 million is the fair value so first you have acquired the bond don't take amortization on all those things in right now right now it's just fair value without amortization just 10 million let's go to the second paragraph right so I'm going line by line. Please follow with me. Whatever work you have been doing till now, leave all your work and focus here. I need 100% focus of yours. Because it's very, it's too much and I'm going line by line. So it becomes very clear to you. So first let's start IFRS 9, financial instruments, requires entities okay make sure that you mention which ifrs requires entities to adopt an expected value approach to the consideration of impairment losses on financial assets now they are saying they are using ifrs 9 to say what is the approach which we have to use for the impairment losses on financial assets there, there's there's an impairment losses on this financial assets right what is an approach an expected value approach, expected value approach has to be used based on IFRS 9. Next, 
on accusation the bonds are considered low risk mention mention it mention in your answer the bond are considered low risk on accusation so on accusation bonds low risk and are not credit impaired this is very important when you're talking about impairment losses you need to say credit impaired whether it's in, uh, credit impaired or not right not credit impaired so low risk right accusation low risk not credit impaired start in a logical order don't start jumping here there right first start with accusation you are acquiring the bond on 31st december 2003 talk about from that point follow a timeline when you write an answer in anything not just ifrs 9 whenever the two dates are given follow a timeline don't start going in the other way around from 2004 and going backwards right so accusation it was low risk not credit impact let's follow follow right follow from here the bonds would be classified as a stage 1 financial asset as at 31st december 2003 class 1 financial asset at which date 2003 so the bonds is classified as stage 1 financial asset very important why is it very important there are three stages to classify a bond there are three stages stage 1 stage 2 stage 3 i'm not going to explain all those stages in detail that is not my thing that is not my aim right now but my aim is that you go through the three stages and you should know how to classify based on the factors given to you the so the factor here is low risk only they have mentioned it's low risk and it's not credit impaired so based on this you can say it comes under what stage 1 financial asset when something is low risk when it's not credit impaired it falls it is classified as stage 1 financial asset on the date mention the date because two dates are there whenever date is there please mention date on this date sbr you always have to mention date you cannot forget about the date right so on this date as at this date it is classified as stage 1 financial asset there has been a table also stage 1 stage 2 stage 3 and how to calculate based on the three stages right right next what happens when is classified as stage 1 now you have to elaborate more on that this means that humming humming's company mention the company please which company are using please mention the company always have a habit of going mentioning the company's name don't just write general answer stage ones mean this we have to do this we have to that's not asked from you just say it is classified as stage one finish so this means that humming should create an expected credit loss equal to 12 months expected credit loss expected credit loss equal to 12 months expected credit loss this is the meaning of stage one classification right it is important to appreciate that the 12 month expected credit loss is not the lifetime expected credit loss a lifetime expected credit loss is not the 12 month expected credit loss don't get confused between this two which an entity will incur which it predicts will default in the next 12 months right so the 12 month expected credit loss is defined as a portion of the lifetime expected credit loss which represents the expected credit losses which results from a default within the next 12 months right it is a portion of a lifetime expected credit or not a lifetime expected credit loss so mm, yeah in effect the proportion right the the proportion of the lifetime expected credit loss which are expected proportion of the lifetime expected credit losses means 12 month expected credit loss in other words they are saying right okay so lifetime expected credit losses which are expected should default occur within 12 months are weighted by the probability of a default occurring 
so they are weighted how by the probability of a default occurring that's how they'll be weighted humming company should therefore recognize a default allowance of what 10000 as as a 31st december 2003 why why should they recognize a default allowance of 10000 i will take you back back to the case study just see 12 month expected credit losses are expected to be 10000 right so that's why the default allowance is 10000 so what happens is, uh, to this default allowance that also you need to know this will be expense to profit or loss and a separate allowance created rather than offset against a 10000 or 10 million bonds this will be expensed separate allowance it will not be created as uh, an offset against 10 million but it would be a separate allowance which is expensed in pnl right because default allowance is an expense only so expense should go to pnl now the allowance is however netted off netted off the 10 million bond in the statement of financial position yes see in the pnl it's not you're not taking it against 10 million bonds but when it comes to the st uh, statement of financial position yes you are netting it netting out against the 10 million bond that means the 10 million bond will reduce by the allowance so uh, the carrying amount on, of the bond in the statement of the financial position at 31st december 2003 will be 9.99 million why 10 million minus the default 10000 in the statement of financial position right the carrying amount will reduce now let's see what's the next para is saying as the bond are to be measured at amortized cost the effective rate of interest of 8% will be included in pnl and added to the bonds right all these things are there in the textbook please make sure that you go through this these are theory parts these are knowledge parts i'm not explaining here this is calculated on the initial 10 million so this 8% is calculated on what on the 10 million not on 9.99 million right and it is not affected here they have told it is not affected by the loss allowance of 10000 so the coupon interest of 500000 is deducted from the carrying amount of the bond right this means that the bond will have a carrying amount of at 31st december 2004 before considering the before considering the impairment allowance this has to be there you have to write it otherwise we'll think that you have considered the impairment allowance here they have showed you the working also how so the balance brought forward is 10 million interest right the coupon interest the effective rate of interest on this is eight percent right which will be added with this and then deduct the coupon five percent so the carrying will be 10.3 million right now let's go to the 2004 so we are over with 2003 scenario now we are seeing what happens in 2004 at 31st December 2004, there has been a significant increase in credit risk. Please mention it. As no actual default has yet confirmed. See, there is no actual default. The bond should be classified as stage 2 financial asset. Yes, if there was an actual default, then it could be classified as stage 3. But since there is no actual default, this is stage 2 financial asset. This means that Humming Company should make an allowance to recognize the lifetime expected credit losses. Right? This is defined as the expected credit losses cash shortfalls, which result from all the possible default even over the expected life of the bond. An allowance is required equal to the present value of the expected loss. 
in the contractual cash flows as weighted by the probability of default they have given the working down but this they have just explained in sentences right so the because you need to explain in sentence and calculate both you have to do so the expected default losses are discounted using the original effective rate of interest of 8% right now let's see 31st december 2005 and 6 what was the cash flow you will be receiving this and this so default was 3% in 2005 and 5% 5 in 2006 so you just multiply the probability of default by the cash flow shortage and then the present value of default add both and you will get the present value of default so now what are the three lines the expected loss allowance should be increased to increase to read the sentences why it is increased to it is not increased by increased to why because already 10,000 was there in the allowance from in 2003 remember now it will be further increased to right with an expense recorded in profit and loss account of 346 why this much you have to record 346 the difference only the difference will be recorded in the PL account it has it will be increased by this amount the increasing amount only you are writing in the PL, not 356825 so an expense it is an expense right it's an allowance allowance is an expense so with an expense recorded in PNL of 346 they have shown how the difference and the loss allowance is deducted directly from the bonds with the future interest income recorded on the gross position the carrying amount of the bond at 31st December would be what is the carrying amount this one this 10.3 minus the present value of default the allowance the total when you deduct from the bond you are not taking 346825 not the PNL account the total amount 356825 you are deducting from 10.3 uh, million how 10.3 million this 10.3 million this carrying forward in 2003 becomes an opening balance in 2004 right this amount it is carried forward to 2004 for the bond so deduct and then you will get the carrying amount for 2004 you can see there's a reduction right there will be a reduction in the value of the bond because of all this impairment and all so that's it that is the whole answer again go through the answer make sure that you understand it very clearly very properly so that's it for question one i have gone through question one of a uh, sbr march 2020 i will also be doing the other three questions don't worry two three and four right So for today, that uh, only this much. Please don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Share this with your friends. Right, exams are coming near, so please help everyone, help others. Help yourself to pass and also help others to pass too. Right, let's all pass together. Best of luck.